Hey, everybody. How's it going? Welcome to our virtual class for Thursday, March 4th on Dracula. I'm in a crypt. I put this on here. Look how creepy it is. Uh, we're going to talk just for a few minutes about Dracula because we mostly are having, we're having a totally asynchronous day. We are not meeting in groups on Thursday morning. You are instead going to make a short posting, the details of which will be on Canvas. And I'm going to talk for just a little bit of time about Dracula to throw a couple of ideas at you to kind of get your minds racing across this next really weird phase of this really weird book that is one of the sort of most fascinating documents of late Victorian modernity that I know, because it sort of includes all the different genres of that uh, kind of modern communications moment, which I'll talk about in a second, um, even as at the same time that it starts to make um, the question of gender dynamics and the sexual problem into a focus of energy and confusion and deep, deep speculation on the part of a whole series of male experts who try their best to use their capacities for knowledge making to put a name to this unnameable problem that has invaded England from Transylvania. So we're going to talk a little bit about the problem of naming and description, the way knowledge intersects with desire and sexuality, what is going on with Lucy, um, and then we're going to talk about blood transfusion. So let's go for a minute. We're going to go for about seven or eight more minutes. Um, be quick. It'll be nasty. Okay, here we go. So this section of Dracula, as you know from reading it, sets into motion a whole series of different plots, the Renfield, Dr. Seward plot, what's going on with this strange patient, this homicidal mania, this zoophagous mania. Multiple names and labels are given to this strange case, uh, which is important for us, especially as we approach Foucault, who will talk to us in the Saussurian vein about how naming phenomena becomes the key part to sort of being able to describe it and place it on the grid of conceptualizable phenomena. So what is Renfield? That's a big question for Seward and as we go on in his efforts to sort it out. So there's that plot. There's the plot through ship's logs and other ephemeral documents of the landing of the ship at Whitby, the dead soldier strapped to the wheel, the dog or wolf that escapes, um, that later seems to arrive in the form of a bloofer lady at the end, if you got to that section. Um, we have that plot of the, of the landing at Whitby. We have Jonathan and Nina's plot as they slowly re reconnect through the administration um, of the Sister Agatha and her letters from the sort of whatever it's called, the religious sanatorium or wherever Jonathan's recovering. And finally, they're reunited again um, over a course of a series of letters between Nina and Lucy, some of which are unopened letters. Um, we have also the, plot, the love plot of Lucy and Arthur Holmwood as they become first engaged to the exclusion of the other suitors. And then finally, as she begins her sleepwalking jags out into the night um, and the sort of eroticized, heavily, heavily eroticized movements into the night uh, that Lucy experiences that result in her being weakened and preyed upon and losing blood. And the only remedy for this is as Van Helsing says, who, who Seward calls in to help in this strange moment, Van Helsing says, a brave man's blood is the best thing for a woman in trouble. Whose blood will it be? Well, that's the question. We remember from last time that Lucy was uh, interested, so she confided to Nina, in being married to three men at once. Why can't they let us do it? Well, guess what happens with Lucy um, over the course of this section that we've seen for today three transfusions of blood. Lucy benefits, although she dies. Um, she ends up in this section that we read for today with the fluids of three different men coursing through her body as one after the other of her former suitors is brought in to lend their life force, as the book tells us, to Lucy's flourishing or survivance. So this sort of eroticized moments of the transfusion of fluids, the combination of multiple male body fluids into the body of one woman, and there's one other man or male figure who's involved in this erotic tangle, 
And that's, of course, Count Dracula, or so we're led to suspect, because we're seeing a bat on the windowsill. We're seeing a person sneak in and sucking on people. We're seeing tiny marks of puncture and penetration that are the signs of this violation of the female body by this unwanted male figure that has to be cured and put away by the combined fluids of these three other suitors. So there's really a lot to say there. And crucially, what is going to be said has to do with close reading. But really quick, I'm going to do a little close reading in one second. Um, but what I want to do now is quick try to share my screen and see if I can get my iPad on here to talk through a few, um, a few documents. Okay, uh, I just took a second there, sorry about that. So let's see if I can get this to work. Well, this was supposed to have worked. You know what, let's forget it for right now. Um, well, I'll try it one more time and see if I can get it through because we're burning time here. Um, one more try for the technology. And it's not working. Okay, uh, forget it. Um, but I have a few diagrams here that are trying to be funny because they're trying to show, show the sort of love triangle, the sort of let's call it the contest over access to the female body that Lucy's at the center of. And that conversely and strangely, we have an almost analogous situation that's gender inverted with Nina and Jonathan, who's insistently feminized in this section as he's laying back, he's incapacitated, he's pale. Um, and that puts Mina in the role of effectively caring for this sort of supine and um, passivized male figure, Jonathan. Um, and we find out um, across the course of this section that their great friend, Mr. Harker, the boss of Jonathan, the bigger man than Jonathan in the firm dies and leaves them money to make them rich. So the movement of Jonathan and Nina from what they describe as sort of middling origins into the status of the wealthy aristocracy. You remember that uh, Arthur Holmwood becomes a lord over the that part moment that we're seeing here. So we have bourgeois professionals like doctors and writers like Nina and, um, and solicitors like Jonathan and all the different professional people who help out in the plot here, writing business letters and, this, and such like that in this section. We have all these professional members of the middle class. And we also have vestigial English aristocracy, Lord Godalming, who's Arthur uh, Holmwood, set against this sort of archaic and feudal and supposedly pre-modern world of blood relations that Dracula represents. So we can imagine, and if you had my screen here, you'd see it, a kind of grid with two sides where on, we have on the east, a whole series of terms, archaic, feudal, blood relations, also appetitive and superstitious, all in quotation marks. And on the other side of the ledger, the west side of the ledger, we have modern bourgeois business relations based on money and contracts. You remember the business letters that say, yeah, we got your money, we did the thing. We have restrained and rational action that's all set against the supposed opposite of these Eastern appetitive desires. You'll remember that the person that the guys call in to help out their situation, old Van Helsing, you tell me in your responses what you think about his linguistic facility in English, sort of comically broken English that suggests in a Saussurian sense, his imprecise fit with uh, the new idioms that he arrives in this modern London world to help solve. He has a foot in both sides of our east-west grid here and Van Helsing. That makes Van Helsing particularly effective in the forms of knowledge that are required to get a handle on this new and as yet unnamed threat. So the way that naming and knowledge and the way that they're coded as eastern or western, modern or supposedly feudal, um, all of these parts are in motion alongside of this heavily eroticized plot, again, about access to the female body and its capacity for reproduction. My blood, his blood, and his blood, all in Lucy's body, 
as we contest ourselves over access to this moment, where as we have that sort of triplicate moment of penetration and access set against the sort of much tidier and let's call it more bourgeois marriage plot um, of Nina and Jonathan, sweet little newlyweds who just come into some money. So we have different models of family, family relation and set against all of this, what I haven't mentioned yet in my last minute, I'm gonna tell you about Renfield, mentioned him before, but I want us to think about how multiple forms of life are sort of pyramidized and consumed in Renfield. You eat the flies, you eat the spiders, you eat the sparrows, then you want a cat, then it gets even weirder than that. As all of these forms of life are brought together and unified in Renfield, he's consuming them. And this weird kind of like collectivized life sits right in the same moment as this strange moment where we have three dudes' blood in one woman's body. So I want us to kind of keep in mind these problems of individuation and collective life as we figure out how the world, how the plot is going to resolve this conflict between a feudal aristocracy based on a kind of like collectivized blood life and the incipiently individualistic um, model of bourgeois society where individuals exchange money and have heteronormative one-on-one -on -one relations like Nina and Jonathan. So we have a whole set of social and economic ties that are eroticized and filtered through the screen of the question of knowledge. Who knows it? How do they know it? And what tools do they use to name the things that they can't name? So that's a few ideas that we can't even get a chance to do close reading on. But your job in your posting is to bring up spe a specific passage or two, no more than two, that you want to focus on as we talk about the novel um, and pick out some details in those passages that you think play out some of these larger questions in microcosm. I'm going to write about that on Canvas, and you'll have con um, a sort of prompt for the post. Thanks for listening to this video. Goodbye from the weird JPEG crypt, and I'll talk to you guys on Tuesday of next week. Thanks a lot.